All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the university and to the conference organizers for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, thank you for my uh, co-panelists' already provocative uh, presentations. Uh, we were encouraged when we were told we were part of this panel to be provocative, and I think they have done exactly that. Uh, Mark, your uh, high-level overview was a nice framing for all the rest of us. Um, I think Todd definitely has his thinking about, you know, what is the value of our time? What is the value of other issues we think about uh, considering new mobility modes? And uh, Tayo did a nice job of showing um, uh, an almost clean natural experiment in Austin. Um, we did an, uh, a national level analysis, so we're zooming out a little bit from the Austin and from the, uh, I guess, the, the double Austin context in a way. Uh, but I'll also zoom out um, in another way and talk about some national trends that I think frame the way we think about energy and environmental implications of some of these new mobility, new mobility systems. Excuse me. Uh, before I jump in, I did want to acknowledge my co-authors, one of whom is here in the room, my advisor, Jeremy Mahalik. So um, also uh, hit him up with questions during the break. All right. So, uh, to kick things off, I want to assert that transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft move people differently. Um, so I'd like to take a poll. Um, I know the, the caffeine from the coffee break is starting to wane, so keep everybody on their toes. Um, how many of you uh, have traveled via um, uh, black car, livery cab, or limo in the past year? Show of hands. Ah, oh, good for you guys. Uh, let me know if you're, you're hiring afterwards. <laughs> Kidding. Um, how many of you have, have traveled via taxi? So more of you. How, who hasn't traveled via Uber or Lyft? Who has not? Still a few hands, all right? But big differences, right? So uh, TNCs like Uber and Lyft uh, are accessing people differently, and they're also moving people differently. So let's think about a conventional trip and a personal vehicle um, from origin O to destination D. You hop in your car, you travel some distance. If instead you travel that same distance in an, I, uh, an Uber or Lyft, you call someone to pick you up from a location first, loca location B here, and it's possible that the Uber or Lyft would come from another location while they're cruising for that ride first. So the same trip that you previously would travel from O to D now involves the miles from A to B to O to D. So we observe more trips in empty miles when these vehicles are moving around without a passenger may actually drive up energy use and associated emissions but um, let's think about the vehicle that you travel in when you're traveling for Uber or Lyft. There are requirements on the newness of that vehicle. It has to be a certain size. And compared to uh, the vehicle of a grad student like me, um, it's probably a nicer car. Um, so um, if you're shifting my rides from my personal vehicle to a vehicle that is newer and potentially has superior um, fuel economy and emissions control, um, there is some tension in what the net effect might be. So a priori, uh, the net effect on energy and emissions is not known. And we care about this because, as all of you mobility experts in this room know, um, TNCs uh, have grown very, very quickly, both in uh, number of markets and share of rides. So what you see on the slide in front of you here along the x-axis uh, is the uh, date of Uber market entry. On the y-axis is the associated market entry by Lyft. And what we're showing uh, in between uh, is the uh, number of uh, metropolitan statistical areas uh, that both of those entered uh, on the, the uh, temporal axes x and y. That y equals x line dotted uh, diagonally across the plot would show uh, um, uh, contemporary entry, so simultaneous entry, of Uber and Lyft in a market. Um, the size of the bubble shows you the size of the metro area, uh, and this plot uh, for our analysis is important because it shows at the state level, um, Uber is consistently entering first. Uh, a few additional observations here. Uh, so Uber uh, launched in 2010, Lyft in 2012, both in San Francisco initially, uh, and really have expanded their markets very, very quickly. Uh, so uh, in, within uh, San Francisco County, uh, TNC has accounted for 15% of within county trips uh, by 2016. In 2018, so over the course of this summer, um, Uber announced the completion of its 10th billion trip. Uh, Lyft got to 1 billion trips. So in the matter of uh, um, eight and six years respectively, uh, that's a lot of people moved. 
Uh, all right, uh, and we care about this because energy and emissions, uh, we understand, could be affected in different ways as a function of how people are using these services. So in terms of vehicle registrations, uh, you see on this table, there are underlying mechanisms that could suggest both an increase and a decrease in the total uh, net effect on vehicle registrations. So a novel employment opportunity, if, if folks want to pick up uh, and benefit from the gig economy, they may purchase a new vehicle, but um, as a uh, um, uh, both Todd and Tayo showed us, for some people it might make sense to use the mobility service instead of a personal vehicle, uh, which might result in a decline in vehicle registrations. Similarly, uh, we see potentially um, uh, opposite effects uh, for VMT. So empty miles and induced travel uh, could increase uh, the number of uh, distances traveled in personal vehicles. But um, if you drop your car, uh, you see the total cost of a trip whenever you call that Uber or Lyft where if I just hop in my vehicle, all I see is that marginal cost, just the fuel, right? Not just thinking about the, uh, the capital cost and the uh, operational cost. So that might reduce the total number of trips traveled. Um, gasoline consumption depends there on if your VMT is going up or down. Uh, and again, on the fuel economy compared to uh, how that trip would have been traveled uh, otherwise. Um, and air pollutant emissions similarly. And actually, uh, TNCs are a relatively new opportunity uh, for personal mobility, uh, but it's, it's <laughs> super interesting and super, super important to study, right? So we're starting to see uh, a literature emerge. A lot of this is, is uh, in white papers now. Uh, we actually see Tayo's uh, paper reflected here um, in this chart. Um, I really, for, for many of you, as you crane your necks to these screens, um, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but the takeaway here I want you to have is for the top half of this, which is showing you um, what's happening in, in one peer-reviewed paper and a variety of other white papers, um, those green conclusions uh, are uh, a white paper sh suggesting that TNCs cause a decline in vehicle registrations. Note that there's two of those. Uh, we also see others that suggest that there's an increase in vehicle registrations, and then we have one that suggests no net effect. So um, the jury is out on this. Uh, as far as uh, uh, what the effect of TNCs on, is on vehicle registrations. Similarly, for VMT, um, there are several papers who have addressed VMT specifically, but there are other ways to think about how people are moving. It might not be quantified specifically as vehicle miles traveled. We can think also of urban congestion, number of trips, and transit riders. Transit riders a little bit further removed, but obviously if you're not uh, moving via transit, um, you might be moving in a personal vehicle instead. Um, again, note the presence both of red and green there. Um, we see uh, uh, increases in VMT or associated effects in some of these papers. Um, again, one of which is published, but most of these are still uh, white papers. Um, but we see other studies that are uh, suggesting declines in congestion number of trips or even um, Hall et al. out of University of Toronto suggested there is one effect that is a decrease in congestion, um, and we also see a, a, an increase in transit riders. So, so what does that net effect mean for, for VMT? We see some internal inconsistency in the same paper even. So this is complicated. Uh, it's important that we have this conversation today. So um, the addition that we make to the literature, um, and we do have a white paper that I think is shared uh, with this community, um, but we, uh, we apply uh, at the US state level a propensity score weighted difference in difference model. Um, and John told me that's all I was allowed to tell you about my method from the podium, so no equations. Uh, but uh, we do that because we want to assert a causal relationship. So to the extent we trust our model, we can assert causality. Um, and we do find a decline in vehicle registrations. So this is at the US state level from 2005 to 2015. And that decline is approximately 3% which over the analysis period translates to 8 million fewer vehicles on the road today as a result of TNC entry uh, over the past eight years. We also see a decline in VOCs uh, of approximately 4.2%, and that has real monetary benefits. There are health damages associated with VOC emissions, so reduction in VOC emissions would translate to um, external benefits of between 20 and $800 million. Um, we tried to test for an effect that would vary across urban areas. So we bend states by rural, middle, or uh, urban states as a function of how urbanized their population was according to the census. Um, we did see some difference in effect, uh, but because we're reducing the number of states that fall into each of those bends, we also reduced our significance there. Um, so you can see that reflected visually here. Um, so to, uh, to continue, uh, to continue uh, provoking uh, you in terms of uh, what you're thinking about for the discussion that follows, um, I want to leave you with this. Um, there are still lots of questions to be answered about how TNCs are affecting our collective mobility system, and a lot of the data we need to answer those questions um, as a research community we don't yet have access to. 
Um, so how do TNC vehicles travel? Um, so active versus empty miles, what is that ratio? What is the ratio of uh, emissions uh, not happening versus uh, additional miles traveled? Which roads uh, are TNCs using? Um, if uh, the way we count vehicles today is uh, systematically different than how we're moving in this new mobility system, we're going to be counting VMT and even vehicle counts uh, incorrectly. Um, TNZ vehicle descriptive statistics. So understanding um, what does the distribution of uh, personal vehicles that we in this room use versus the distribution of vehicles that TNC drivers use. That will help us understand are trips getting more efficient or not. Um, trip volume. Um, how many drivers do we have? How many passengers? Number of trips? You know, what is, we've seen so many disaggregations of, of oil used today, right? But how is that oil used within transportation? We don't know what that TNC wedge looks like, right? Um, service territory, so how has this evolved over time in a way that allows us to understand which populations are moving and how might those populations be moving differently than uh, in other areas. And then driver shifts, what does that look like over the course of the day and we th that we could understand um, this is a TNC travel day, um, they are offsetting other trips and we can start to make comparisons and quantifications and the types of outcome metrics I've talked about here uh, that we can't yet say state conclusively. And so uh, with that, I hope I have sufficiently provoked you. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'll pass it back to Mark for our panel. <coughs>